Thank you very much. Uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, we don't have much time, so um, we'll go right into the presentation. Uh, let's flick through here. Um, <clears throat> I think CBI, um, you've had a description. Um, we are an odd couple, an odd combination, the founders, a uh, German and a British guy working together. Uh, it's not often found and doesn't often Against last. each other, we don't work together. Uh, too, uh, well, you know, Marcus is you know, confused. <laughs> <laughs> often the case. You can see from Europe how well we work together. It's, it's no problem whatsoever. <laughs> so um, let's move on to um, the, the, the next slide. And uh, please, <coughs> what we started now, we will do throughout the complete presentation. What we want to make clear before we begin to present is that nothing we present today is absolute. It's examples of success, it's examples of failure. And success and failure today is a very, very thin line, which has to be challenged every day. And so David sometimes will jump into what I say and will uh, create an antithesis to it, and I will do the same. So please... No, 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 it's only me to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So, I have to get familiar with the equipment here. David. Okay, um, the, the theme, um, we focused somewhat on the automotive industry, but we have actually stretched it to cover some other industries. Um, and what is, um, what is driving us to talk about this thing is what we see in the market, what we see happening around us, what we see changing very rapidly in the world. We see a shift in the center of gravity. Uh, basically, um, a lot of the G8 countries um, are not only seeing manufacturing move to other countries, but they're also seeing their own market shrink, uh, particularly in the case of Germany and Japan. And these concurrent changes mean that we have to re-examine the way we do things, we have to shake everything up, we have to look at new ways of rediscovering innovation and new ways of making partnerships across borders. And our job, um, our day job, when we're not talking here, is, is to help companies to do that, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Today, we will uh, explain you very, very shortly who we are, then we will talk a little bit about where we see current problems and challenges of most of the G8 countries. And then we will give you examples of companies who are solving challenges, who are still having an entrepreneurial spirit, who are setting up new ideas. We talk a little bit about open innovation and open sources. Uh, we try to give you concrete examples of companies and markets. And uh, then we will have a little wrap up and we have 50 minutes to do this. Uh, oh, right, only 50. Um, here we have uh, a detailed explanation of why both of us are wonderful and extremely well qualified to talk to you about these things, which we will not go through in detail. Um, we, we've had a, an introduction already. Um, what I would say is that we have been working together since 2006. Uh, we've known each other since 1999. Um, and one thing that we've discovered in working together is that, as Marcus mentioned earlier, um, just the two of us find that if you give us a single problem, we will find two completely different ways to arrive at the solution. But our objective will be the same, and the solution if ultimately will be the same. So that's the experience we bring uh, to, which is behind the presentation today. And what might be interesting from your perspective, we have managed companies in different phases. We do a lot of entrepreneurial stuff. We are changing major organizations at the moment who have to get a new spirit, a new culture into their organization. But unfortunately, we also had to manage major company in their last phase, which is bankruptcy. We have been involved in crisis management of companies which went insolvent by managing their Japanese uh, affiliates, and that's one of the short cases we will have, or sh short examples we have later. One more thing there. Um, one, one thing um, that we were talking about earlier is that um, we have the, the privilege of being involved at the start 
and in some cases the end of companies or the rebirth of companies. And, and one thing that that's taught us over the last 25, 30 years is that um, you can have a great brand, um, but that doesn't mean that you're guaranteed survival. Um, you can have a great idea, but that doesn't mean that when it comes to implementation, you're guaranteed growth. Um, these things take planning and hard work. Very briefly, what we are doing, we have four major pillars. We do operational consulting. Um, that's exactly what Boston and McKinsey don't do. We are not doing strategic consulting. We are really going into companies, we work together with them to solve problems and find solutions, and we implement them. That means we are involved in the realization of solutions. And um, one of the things that also we were, we were thinking about um, when we were writing uh, the presentation um, was in relation to business plans. And the great thing about a business plan is that you can write it and it's immediately out of date. Fantastic. So when we started together, um, number two, alliances and partnerships, was really not part of the business plan. Um, but it's um, an activity which has grown out of requests from our customers. Um, we've got involved in helping people to start joint ventures, helping people to negotiate joint ventures, helping people to avoid going into joint ventures that aren't a good idea. And merger and, merger and acquisition also, um, it's, it's, it's come to us, right? Yeah. The third pillar is company representations and interim management. We are involved in companies, we are running them. I'm CEO of one company, I in the I'm in the board of two other companies, and I'm also a board member of a Japanese, Japanese joint venture, for example, in which I'm responsible for the European expansion and strategy. And then, um, again, I think originally we weren't um, planning to, be, to get into training and development, but um, because of the, the requirements of, of the customers and of the situations, if you want to change something, if you want to grow something, you need the right skill set, you need the right people, and we've developed a, a portfolio of products to help people achieve that. And under all of these activities, there's tools and methods. And I think many of these tools and methods is what you are learning to uh, apply here in your courses. Yeah. That's the wrong direction. Yeah, we don't want that photo again. OK. <laughs> Our major industry was automotive. Um, and the other stuff basically came to us in projects because we were recommended. Today, we are also in food alternative energies, and a lot of other manufacturing businesses. And services. Yeah. That's the wrong That's direction, direction again. again. <laughs> so, let us begin with the content for today. Where does success come from? I think, especially to an MBA class, you don't have to really talk long about this. It's all the points from flexibility, having the right idea, having the right people, having the right company culture. Basically, to be flexible, move fast enough into markets. But what happens if you look into most major companies today, they don't have many of these points today anymore. They, they, many are not flexible anymore. Um, some of them don't do have clever marketing placement anymore. And uh, why is this? A big reason for this is our old friend, Mr. Maslow. I think all of you studied them, and we forget about them. It's him. It's a very, very old theory, but it applies, and we will see later also graphics which prove that he still is alive and uh, it is applied. We have grown out in the G8, out of the first two levels of the pyramid, which is sleep, eat, drink, sleep, eat, drink, regularly. So get safety and then take care on your personal belonging and needs. We are in a level where we began to produce in big scale, where we made big money. And in order to change this, we have to change what made us strong. We have to change our environment. 
and we are doing a lot of change management and the psychology about change is that change is not easy because it contradicts with your routine. If I want to change, I have to change my routine. I have to get up to other times, I have to eat differently, I have to spend my money differently. And everybody who tells me he wants to do this basically is a liar. Normally people don't want to do it, they want that the other side has to change. And we have been imposing change on a lot of other nations for a long, long time. But unfortunately, now we are in a situation that other nations are imposing change on us. So, I, I, what, what all this really amounts to is, you know, if you get rich, you get fat and lazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and <clears throat> if we look into Japan and Germany, we have the following problems, and I think you also know them. Declining society, strong yen, since the, this week it's changing, luckily, again. Overaging society. There's a major hunt for young talent which can't be satisfied. We have HR structures and companies which frustrate people. They can't grow. They can't do the things they want. They get bored. They leave. Uh, we need access to new markets and growing markets. We need innovation management, which is one of the biggest hurdles of most of many companies. Time to market and the right product to the market is a huge issue in most companies. Uh, balanced um, relationship between headquarters and subsidiaries to understand that developments have to be done in, in new places in the major markets today. Um, to grow into China and India. And for Japan, to some extent, not to some extent, a major Galapagos effect. We come to this later a little more. And a society structure which uh, makes it difficult to get enough people into good positions. If we compare this to Europe with a focus on Germany, we see that our problems are very, very much the same. And uh, before we talk about solutions now, we would like to come a little bit into where are the growing markets and where do we have to adjust to. So what does change of gravi uh, gra gravity center mean? Here you see the first university degrees in natural science and um, I think the graphic is clear how many people come from Chinese universities, how many come from Japanese universities and other Asian countries. China is producing engineers and natural scientists in an incredible dangerous speed. The same... <laughs> that explode. <laughs> Uh, the same in engineering. Uh, if you look at 2008, 700,000 engineers. In the same period in Germany, 20,000 engineers left the university. Yes, yes, and I hear many people say, yeah, yeah, they cannot manage as good as we have. They don't have the same history. Sorry, I think that's bollocks. Because we are successfully training them to do it at the moment. Japan and Germany, we have plants there, we produce there. We teach them all our systems and management systems. And please tell me why under 700,000 engineers there should be less geniuses than within Germans and Japanese engineers. They will be successful and we can't stop it and we don't want to stop it because it's the nature of the world. You shouldn't stop gravity, it will happen. Well, I mean, this is also um, just things going back to where they were, um, honestly speaking, before the Europeans invaded the China, China and India uh, and the rest of Asia and um, stopped them from developing. I mean, before 1700 or so, I think India and China together had, what, 50% of world trade? So there's no reason why it won't go back. These are the patents, and you see in the patent area, we are still posting a lot of patents in Japan and Euro, uh, but also China is coming up extremely here, and if you look at to, into the Asian eight without Japan, you see where the patent grows is. Well, I'm not convinced that that's the main indicator, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <clears throat> Average annual growth of R&D expenditure and that 
shows very, very clearly too that in 2008 and 2009, some countries reduced their R&D expenditures compared to the previous pe uh, periods. And China, uh, for example, is increasing here a lot too. Mm. Researchers, a uh, comparable picture that uh, the growth of researchers in the same period between 1995 and 2002 and 2002 and 2009. Uh, China, South Korea, Taiwan. This is where the growth uh, is taking place. And if you look into Samsung, for example, or in, into Hyundai, you see that this can directly translate into major success. Hmm. This is the percentage of R&D expenditure uh, in comparison to um, economic output. And Japan and South Korea, United States, all these countries are very high up there, but you see also here, China is picking up. Uh, David Seirat will later <laughs> yes, we'll, elaborate we'll, a little <laughs> bit on this, that this does <laughs> not necessarily have to translate into success. It's, this is a number. The question is, what does the number mean? And uh, what does it mean for where you spend your money and how you spend your money? Scary numbers. <laughs> Let's get a little bit to Japan. Um, after the Second World War, the industry structure and the Kiretsu stru structure, which developed in Japan, was very, very successful. And it helped Japan to develop to the second uh, biggest economy in the world. What we have today, unfortunately, is a country in which 99% uh, of all Japanese companies are SMEs. 75% of the labor force works in these companies. But unfortunately, these SMEs only contribute with 15% to the Japanese export. On the other side, we have the real successful global players like a Toyota, like a Toshiba. Um, and they find all this potential of these SMEs. These SMEs are totally directed to the big stars in the Karetsus or the big global players of Japan. But if these big global players get a little headache, there is a big chance that the companies under them die severely. And if you look into the company structure of SMEs in Japan, the innovation potential and globalization potential is not really high. The system is focused on the star only, on the Keretsu Center. And that means that the supplier structure and the complete market structure is only serving one big customer, and that can lead to a heavy Galapagos effect, which we currently, unfortunately, see a lot in Japan. In Germany, we do not have this problem. The figures look pretty much the other way around. Just a, just a question. How, how do you define Galapagos? I mean, what, what do you see, what do you mean by that? Because the original meaning uh, maybe is not quite the same. Let me, let me give you an example. Yeah. I don't say the company name now. Let's say um, an automotive company is producing engines. And um, they, an engine in an automotive industry is used worldwide, but it has to be adjusted to specific markets. You have to adjust it to America, you have to adjust it to, to Europe, you have to adjust it to China, and to do this, you have to have access to the controller of this engine. But if the software of this controller is completely programmed in Japanese, if um, Denso, for example, has the only hardware connection to this controller. But unfortunately, Denso would not have now enough global resources to do the engine adjustment in every single market. You would reach a bottleneck because nobody worldwide can help you in adjusting your engine. If you would have a supplier strategy which allows you to adjust your engine in every single market, with local suppliers, and you could share this know-how, then you would be much more flexible in your growth strategy. Does that answer your question? It, it answers the question, but actually, um, I think originally it had also an additional 
meaning. The idea was that um, very interesting ideas have developed in Japan in isolation because of it has a somewhat unique market. And the, the original thought behind it was to say, well, let's take these interesting ideas and bring them to the rest of the world. And uh, the question is, how do you do that? I need this one. I'm, I'm overwhelmed with technology here. Okay, yeah, going back. Okay, now, um, I just want to point out, before you say anything on this, that this is a German slide. It's all in German. And it's completely ridiculous because it shows Germany still above the UK, even in 2050. So you believe it as much as you like. But, Carry uh, on. but what, we did, what we did on the slides, we made it uh, compatible to British. We know that they know flags. So the colors of flags is a pattern they understand. And they understand where they are below Germany. And ours isn't better than yours. So um, very short about this slide. It simply shows what is happening every day in our reality. The center of gravity is changing. China, BRICS will be up there, but at the same time, the European countries are not totally using, losing. It's not like they are vanishing. It's not a catastrophe where a meteorite hits the Earth and we are gone. No, we only have to adjust ourselves to a new situation. Just like to point out the French do vanish. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any French here? Oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> Try harder. Uh, David, one, one of our customers is sitting in the back, <laughs> and he's French. One of our ex-customers. <laughs> okay. um, so it's about how we do alliances, how we redirect ourselves to really find a good balance with the new centers of the gravity. Let's talk now a little bit about winners and losers. On this page, you see a couple of brands or companies or um, softwares which didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, Samsung was, in the beginning 10 years ago, had a good local product, but now is a severe competitor to, for example, Panasonic and Sony. At the same time, Apple achieved the same and to some extent, they are basing their success, for example, on Android, open source. It's a software where every person who wants to can participate and publish up, uh, applets, and it's freeware. The same with Linux. We have in Germany now the first cities, for example, Munich. They kicked out Microsoft. They run complete cities with 1.2 million people on Linux because it's cheaper and more effective. If you look on the uh, bottom side, on the URA of uh, these companies, you will find, for example, Sony and Panasonic. And if it's interesting, because Sony and Panasonic had everything they needed to compete with Apple. They had hardware, they had software, they had a global network, so they, they, didn't, they didn't come up with the same ideas or they didn't want to do it. Why didn't they want to do it? They didn't want to do it because Sony, for example, had existing media business. They were selling records and movies. So they didn't want to cannibalize their own business. Apple did it. They had the ideas and they grew hardware and software along it. Panasonic is an excellent technology and production company. So Panasonic was focusing on technology and production. They didn't want to go into neighboring fields with software or service platforms or anything related. Unfortunately, Samsung did. But don't you think also that um, they had a disadvantage in not being as strong in software development as companies like Apple? Well, they could have built it. But they would have had to expand not only their way of thinking, but also their development centers, I think. Yes, they would have had to change. Mm. But I don't say that Panasonic or Sony are dead. Definitely not. These companies don't, don't die. You know, Apple didn't die. Apple was gone and came back. But they, to a certain extent, they will have to reinvent themselves. And uh, they, I'm convinced they will do it. They're not dead. They're just resting. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
And this is not a new story, it's just a piece of history repeating. Um, that's a very trivial example. Circus, for example. Circus simply died. It was boring. Nobody wanted it anymore. But at the same time, Circus Soleil is a multi-million dollar business. And if you listen to Daniel Lamar, he says, I start a typical office day by asking myself the question, what can I do today, which seems impossible. And uh, actually, we sometimes do this uh, ourselves. Losing and winning brands, examples. <laughs> the former CEO of Britannica about Wikipedia. We are not concerned about an encyclopedia in which any idiot can publish his know-how. What a wrong evaluation, my friend. A little smarter was the CEO of Langenscheid in Germany, who also comment, it's a dictionary company. How can I compete with a company which does not want to make profit and gets millions of US dollars donations as soon as they publish that they need money for a new server? Yeah, correct statement. But why didn't he have the same idea? He could have, for example, focus on high-level dictionaries for translators or special areas and publish most of the know-how free of charge and connect it with advertisement. They didn't. The market had to force them in a situation where they do it today. Hmm. Some interesting statements. Bill Gates, Microsoft is always two years away from insolvency. The world belongs to the unsatisfied. If you enter the headquarters of Coca-Cola, that's in the entrance. The CEO of Body Shop says, what I like about Body Shop is that we do not believe in rules. Uh, do you work in a company that doesn't have rules and doesn't believe in them? Probably not. That's my favorite. Watanabe, former CEO of Toyota, when they got number one, and in the interview he said, arrogance and ignorance are the fatal sickness of big corporations. There are no successful companies. There are only some companies which made the right decisions in the past. Today, Toyota is not number one anymore, but they are striving to still play up there. That's out of a management book from German authors, and they say managers today not only should be paranoid, they have to be. Because who isn't innovative, who doesn't reinvent his business every day, has to compete with 2.6 billion Chinese and Indian people. Well, not just Chinese and Indians. I mean, who's taking, who's taking on iPhone? Google. Yeah, you don't have to go outside your own country for competition, and Japan is a highly competitive market. <clears throat> I will not run through this slide in total. What makes brands non-competitive? I think we mentioned many of these points, but to a big extent is unflexibility, Hmm. Arrogance, arrogance, too much production volume that makes you unflexible. It makes you unflexible in your investments. So these are all reasons why brands could become not successful. I brought an old friend of mine, the mouse. And there is a very interesting experiment about my friend. She was captured in the wildness and she is put into an experiment. The experiment has four long pipes and uh, they put cheese in the pipe and they put the cheese in different pipes every day. The mouse comes from nature so she's used to search for the cheese and she finds it and she is happy. In the second part of the experiment you put the cheese for a long long time in the same pipe every day. The mouse gets used to it and only goes into this pipe. If you put the cheese somewhere else, the mouse actually will not find it anymore and dies. And this happens to people if they are not challenged every day. I don't want to compare our brain and our way of thinking to a mouse. Don't get me wrong. But um, there, is, there is some thought about it what happens if we don't think about what we do and why we do it. 
Brands can be very strong and they can survive crisis. I don't know if you remember the Grand Spa crisis of Shell. They were sabotaged worldwide and nobody bought from Shell. They survived it. GM just could go bankruptcy and they survived it. But these cases are fortunate because they had a big public interest and uh, they couldn't be let down. That's the only reason why they survived. We were running a um, leading German engineering company here in Japan between 2006 and 2010, and you might have seen these cars. They were a producer of cars. They were producing for Mercedes-Benz. They were producing for Volkswagen. And in 2007, they had 150 million euro turnover. 2008, they were profit uh, profitable. 2009, they went insolvent. That happened in two and a half years, and nobody expected it. Mm. Here are some other German brands which got insolvent. In order to stay on top of the wave, companies have to be know-how leader, production leader, they have to have access to markets, and they have to be competitive in all areas. And most SMEs in Europe and in Japan do not fulfill these conditions anymore. So Actually, they, it says they attract young talent, but um, that's not strictly true. Attract talent, yes. So, that's yes, correct. <laughs> he wants to justify that he still has a job. Um, <laughs> the, well, I still employ you. Huh. <laughs> um, and in order to do this, we have to think about new ways, and that's the second part of our presentation. Innovative business models, cooperation, and partnerships. SimDrive. Does anybody know SimDrive here? Ah. <laughs> Thank you. Are you a, ah, yes, I've seen your face. <laughs> yes. You have been last year in the kickoff in, uh, in March for the project, I, I think. SimDrive. I start a little different. To build a car, to develop a car, this is what you need. A big organization, hundreds of engineers, billions of euros investments, complete sales and ne uh, service network, own motor, chassis, electric department. So. Basically, nobody can enter this market. It's impossible. So this is impossible. What you see here, the left, but the picture on the left, the bus and the car in the middle, the white car, we can argue about the design, but it's driving, uh, would be not possible in conventional systems. But they exist and they are very, very close to mass production. You can bring these vehicles to mass production under Issen Oku, one, under 1 billion euro. That sounds like a lot of money. Believe me, in automotive business, to bring a car to production, it's very, very small money. Um, and that was possible because Professor Shimizu uh, from Keio University developed some new ideas and founded a company which does not want to compete with OEMs. They don't even want to produce these cars. They can produce them, but they don't want to. Their business model is based on the idea to have a couple of very good patents, know-how in core technology, in this case the wheels, the in-wheel motors, and they invite other companies to participate in this know-how. They allow them to develop cars and components together with them, to study the components, and then take away this know-how with a royalty fee or with a license fee to produce them themselves if they want to. Um, you would say that is a strange concept, isn't it? Nobody with brains would finance something like this. This is a small overview of companies which participated in the first project. I think you might recognize some of them and some companies don't want to be listed in public. There's a couple of more companies behind this which are listed in the Nikkei and are major players. In the second project, which was uh, is, uh, is still running this year, these companies participated. And I think um, 
the gentleman who said who knows the project is from one of these companies. Um, Marcus, so, sorry to interrupt. I, I don't think the people at the back can see the names of those companies. Can you maybe name a few? Hitachi, Bosch, Dassault, Sunstar Engineering, uh, Toyota Tsubo Corporation, Mikuni. Um, Peugeot. Peugeot. <laughs> so um, there are some. Uh, in the first project we had Isuzu, Mitsubishi Motors, uh, Takada. So all very major Japanese companies and the project is getting also more and more international traction now. So it's open source, anybody can participate. The target is to have technology leadership only in very, very few areas. These companies do not want to compete with existing producers of cars, they want to be seen as an extension to their R&D development activities. Financial model is to live from patents, royalties, and participation fee, current success level, 100% of what we expected and were planning. The companies who participate, yes, they have a lot of brains, and we have more and more concepts like this coming up. In Germany, we have a concept which is called NOAE, Network of Automotive Excellent. And this NOAE has developed a system together with a lot of, um, just a moment, together with major companies like BMW, Siemens, uh, ZF, there's a picture later, where, they, where these big companies say, we are not innovative enough. Innovation doesn't go through our purchasing department and through our engineering department because they don't want innovation. They want to innovate their own stuff. They are a block for innovation. So they founded a network where people can apply for innovation and if they win a prize, they get direct access to the board members of these companies and the board members make sure that this innovation is promoted in their companies. These are companies who are supporting and participating. And uh, CBI Partners helped two companies from Japan to participate in this project this year. And I don't know if you know Kureha. Kureha won a first prize, and they will be um, put on stage on the 7th of April in Germany. So here you see a lot of companies who want open innovation, who want that companies and private people bring innovative ideas into their organizations because they can't do it themselves anymore. Okay. And even, of... and even the UK has innovation. <laughs> yes, yes. David, for a long time. You're David just Klain. discovering it. Enough of this German stuff. Good grief. We're falling asleep. Um, okay. Um, basically, just to recap on some of the things, this doesn't show the names because that protects the guilty. Um, but what we know is that um, innovation drives GDP. So the higher your innovation goes, the higher your GDP goes, although it does fade off a bit. Um, if we look at the next slide, we see that unfortunately, as GDP rises, entrepreneurial activity tends to fall because we get fat and lazy. Um, and it falls more in, in different places. But generally speaking, you see the curve is, these are, these are the, uh, the countries where you have to innovate to survive, and these are the countries where if you innovate, you could be fired. <coughs> so it's not surprising it drops off. If we look at the next slide, we go back to the scary slide about the number of patents issued. And one measure that people use of, um, shall we say, innovative power is number of patents per capita or spend on R&D. That's the axes we've got here. But overlaid on top of that is an international evaluation of innovativeness. And what you see is that there isn't a very good correlation between number of patents or high R&D spending and innovative capability. So up here we have, uh, sorry, Japan. Um, spending a lot, getting a lot of patents, but scoring rather low on innovativeness, which means probably that they're not bringing the innovations to market. 
not using them effectively. Um, very rudely and unintentionally, we've covered Germany with the United States. That was entirely unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> but had I thought about it, I would have done it. Um, and you can see that, you know, um, basically the Americans are still getting great bang for their bucks um, in, in innovation. And rather scarily, these, these countries with no money, like the United Kingdom and China, um, are, are actually getting a fairly high innovation score without spending all that money. So we have to think hard about what we're doing with our innovation money and how we're bringing our innovations to market. And the next slide uh, is, it's a little bit complicated, but this is a slide from an actual UK company and it shows the network which they've created globally. And what we're talking about here is a company which has innovative, paradigm shifting, disruptive technology um, in the area of ethanol production. They, ha they, they create um, an essential part of the ethanol production process, which is the filtration of the ethanol. They, re they create a product which removes the water from the ethanol so that it can be used for, for fuel in vehicles. So big market in Brazil, very big in uh, the United States due to legislation in, in both countries. It's a very small company. It, it has 20 employees, um, and it's a truly global company. They have a facility in the UK, they have a facility in Germany, and a facility in Canada. Uh, <laughs> it's remarkable that they find the time with only 20 people there. They also have an office in Brazil. Um, and in order to supply the complete product, components, assembly, this is sub-assembly, assembly into the filtration unit, um, engineering to put it into the process, and final engineering to test and validate the whole thing, um, they've created this global alliance of partner companies. Um, and what this requires is um, an enormous amount of openness and an enormous amount of trust and integrity amongst the partners. And I have to say that it's, it's not easy to maintain that. It's a, it's a constant effort. It's not like, okay, here's the solution. You form global alliances and they work. Um, it takes hard work to keep something this complicated going. It's, it's like Cirque du Soleil. <clears throat> but if we have a look at some of the partners that they've recruited to, uh, to this small core UK company, um, they've got the Los Alamos National Laboratory supporting them on research in the US, um, both with research and financially. Um, they've got US engineering partners. Um, if we look at Canada, the Canadian government is funding um, one of their prototype assembly units. Um, they're doing R&D in Canada in order to achieve that. The guy who started the company originally, I hate to say it was German, uh, and is still there, but you know he's done a good job. Uh, the Carbon Trust is contributing. They have um, a cooperation with the university in China. They've got funding together with their Japanese supplier of membranes for a development project in Europe. And, and let me jump <coughs> in here for everybody in this room. If your company is having innovation and would like to bring it to Europe, there's a fund often yep. open from the European Commission with 6.7 billion euro. Um, and Japanese companies can apply for it. SMEs especially, also big companies, together with in cooperation with uh, European companies. So please begin to, to look for these chances. If you have questions about it, the European Commission or CBI can always talk to you. Yeah, it's on the next slide. Um, <laughs> But you can see that you know it is it is possible to create and manage this this kind of global alliance. Um, you just have to want to, and you just have to assemble the uh, the know-how and the team to do it. And CBI is proudly part of that global team. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, so we, we thought, well, what would that look like if you were, for example, a Japanese company um, going to Europe? Um, forget about you know the complicated going to North America at the same time, working with China, etc. Supposing you were just to focus on Europe, would you be able to do it? And and we think yes. Um, and and some of the strange things that that we've discovered in researching what small, medium-sized companies are doing in Japan, 
there is a lot of government support available. And according to a Microsoft-sponsored economist survey, um, only 40% of Japanese small and medium-sized companies that export and go overseas use the government support which is available. So 60% either don't know that the support is available or perhaps reasonably think it will be so complicated applying for it that they'd rather jump off a building. Um, <coughs> however, leaving that aside, um, they, they can collaborate with, with European universities. If you have a great idea, you start a small, innovative technical company, you can go to a university in Europe, you can get funding, as Mark has said, from the European Union, and you can get going. Uh, it's, it's really not that complicated. Um, you can still, along each stage, get support from the Japanese government. Jetro will help you. Uh, it's, it's perfectly possible to achieve that. It's just that people don't seem to be doing it. And one of the things that, that I think is an asset for Japan, and to some extent for, for European companies also going outside of Europe, is national brand image. I think if you're looking for partners and you come as a Japanese company to Europe, you get a fairly good reception. Um, if as a European company you come to Japan, you get a fairly good reception. So there is a kind of natural um, ability to work together. And, and that helps, that, 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 that really um, makes it easier to, to develop the trust that you need for these global alliances. And that shouldn't be un, uh, underestimated. So if we go along to the next slide, I suppose one question is, well, you know, would a Japanese company really do that? I mean, is that likely? Um, well, yes, it is. It's very likely because one of the examples that comes from this report issued in December 2010 is a very interesting equivalent of this UK company, a Japanese company, pure Japanese company called Aqua Science Corp. 22 employees, and they make steam syringes for semiconductor production, which cleans the semiconductors or something. <coughs> and they've set up, they have, they have interesting innovative technology. They've got an interesting innovative business structure, which is becoming more and more common, where they outsource the manufacturing entirely. They don't do the manufacturing, so they, they reduce their capital uh, requirement. This is similar to the UK company. Um, and They've gone directly overseas. They, they, they haven't said, OK, let's go to Mitsui Sumitomo or whoever. They said, nope, we'll go for venture capital in Taiwan, Korea, and the US. And they've convinced people, and their company's up and running. And they're, they're very happy with the situation. They're saying, you know, basically, it's easier to work that way. The CEO says that the culture in Japan is risk averse, focused on not making mistakes. Whereas business people in China, Korea, and Taiwan, they're committed. They accept risk. They're still hungry. So what does that mean for us? That means that, that there, there, is, there are ways now, as, as we globalize, it's possible from a base in Japan, or actually from a base in Europe, as we saw earlier, to, to tap into the global network with an innovative approach to bringing your product to market and grow. Uh, and one of the good things about that um, a byproduct of the growth of, of small and medium enterprises in, in both areas, Japan and Europe, is that SMEs tend to use far more older workers than established larger companies. In fact, the people leave the larger companies and go to the SMEs. Um, so when you have a rapidly aging population, um, this can only be a good thing. <laughs> As a rapidly aging person, I, I've, I'm all in favor. Let's go. <laughs> the last example we would like to bring is partnership and alliances, and we would like to go back to the automotive industry. And just to start this part with a figure. In Germany, in the next 10 years, more than 150,000 SMEs do not have a successor. Hence, they must be sold to be continued. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't mean that these people are easy people to buy their companies from. A lot of these people are like the founders in Japan. They don't want to sell to anybody. They want that their spirit and the spirit of the company continues. 
The example I create now is totally irrelevant, but we need an example to talk about. Let's assume we have a German automotive supplier who produces filters for air systems. So like the air filters, which take out the pollen and the kafun stuff. Um, and they are very local, but they're in all top lines in German cars. They're in Audi, Mercedes, BMW, whatever you think of, they are in, but they did not globalize. They're highly profitable, and they have a really good market share. On the other side, we have Benzo, for example, a Japanese uh, aircon producer who has problems to get. I can negotiate with you a little bit. Like, um, I need five minutes longer. Is that okay? Arigato. No, no. <laughs> longer than the 10. Shall I go and negotiate? Okay. <laughs> Um, and, and this Japanese supplier is basically global. But like many Japanese, he's in China, he's in America, he's everywhere. But unfortunately, many Japanese automotive suppliers did not really make it into the European and German market. They have problems there. So to buy a company like this would be the perfect match, and I explain on the next couple of slides why this would not only be a good match for Germany. These figures come out of an M&A project which we had one, one and a half years ago, so they are not 100% up to date, but they haven't changed much. The total production of vehicles in 2010 was around 67 million units. It will grow to around 90 million units in 2016. We did the work and we analyzed um, who is producing these cars. We don't analyze where they are produced in this slide. We are analyzing which capital produce it. For example, if you have Japanese and you have a red bar in here, that means also Japanese cars which are produced in North America. And you see that the Japanese production uh, grows from 20 million to 25 million again, probably a little higher. The European makers follow this, and then you have the North American makers uh, at, the sec at the third biggest bar at the moment. If you look into the shares, the Japanese have around 30%, European 30%, and the North American around 22% and the Chinese are at around 8% and the rest of the world 1%. How does this look in 2016 according to uh, CSM, which is the data provider behind it? Whoops, you didn't see a change, did you? There's only a very, very little change, but that's not logic, is it? Because China is growing so much uh, that nobody can believe that there is not much change. I don't believe these figures, I think China will be a little bigger, but basically, I think it's correct. Because let's look into China. China is exploding in production. That's the red line, while all the other countries are only slower growing. Let's look into China. 37% of the cars produced in China are from Chinese. 16 from uh, European. Japanese with not 20% and the North American have around 20% there. But Chinese people don't only want to buy Chinese car. There is so many people with money at the moment and they want to buy uh, a lot of luxury brands. Uh, Peugeot or Mercedes-Benz or um, cars which are not Chinese. So the share of other producers in China is big, and they participate in this growth. And also here, the change to 2016 is not so big. Maybe the figures will look a little different, but it will be a growth in which we all can participate if we make the right decisions. Now back to our example of the filter producer. The Japanese potential buyer has productions in China, but he is not delivering at the moment to European makers there. So if he would buy the R&D capability in Europe, if he would cooperate with this supplier, which doesn't have a base, he could use the existing production capability and produce in China 
for German producers, which are not his customers at the moment. So it would be a really high uh, synergy effect. This is a very simple synergy slide um, on, a, on a top management level where you say, what's about customers? Yes, they are complementary. They don't have uh, overlapping customers and cannibalize themselves. Their markets would also be complementary. Their organizations would be complementary, maybe in purchasing or in R&D. You could fire some people or reduce cost, let's say it nicer. Um, their locations would be a perfect match. Their products and technologies. So on a simple graphic, you would see that these two companies would be a perfect match. But it's not that easy. If you would knock the door of this traditional German maker and would say, I want to buy your company, he would say, move out. I don't want to sell just to a Japanese to sell. I don't want to sell, buy, sell to a Chinese just to sell. I want to keep the identity of the company. And there is a lot of cases today where we face exactly this problem, where we have to negotiate with both partners, the company which is taken over and the company which is bought, that they find the right pattern. And there is something in between M&A. M&A can be a process which takes five to 10 years that you say we begin with cross participations. We begin with exchanging stuff, with exchanging products or licensing, and then if this works well, we go the next step. So you create an implementation path. You define a common target, you define what you want to achieve, and along these targets, you define a capital increase in companies. These are multi-dimensional governances. So you decide who will be the boss at which phase. What, are, what is the implementation phase? How long do you do something together and wh where are the exit gates if they are required? And if you do this correctly, you gain trust and partnership and then suddenly you can buy or cooperate with companies who would never ever have talked to you before. Everybody trying to expand globally with people leaving Japan at a high rate is, is very important. We see a lot of companies these days looking to buy in Europe, looking to buy outside of Japan. Um, and this kind of innovation in the structure is important. And if you know these structures are not that innovative at all, the term multidimensional governance was developed here in Tokyo by Baker and McKinsey, by Markus Janssen, um, partner in this, in this law firm. But if you really analyze what Carlos Ghosn did, he did the same. He had the complete control over Nissan, but he didn't execute it. Hmm. He did not decide to develop common cars immediately. He did not decide on putting the R&D departments together because he well recognized that the company cultures, the way how cars are produced in both companies are complete different. To have a ruling minority of French in this company wouldn't have worked. The company cultures had to grow together first and two years ago, uh, the two companies for the first time began to actually develop a common platform. So it took them almost 10 years to get to a point where they do common R&D. In the process of this, Carlos Ghosn made sure that Nissan is not a taken over company, but an equal partner which owns shares in Renault. So then came the cross participation. And by doing all these steps, he created one company with two different cultures and production philosophies, which was an extremely smart and admirable move from him. So, what we wanted to bring across to you, I leave to David. Okay, very quickly, um, before we get attacked by the timekeepers, um, what, what do we, what do we um, summarize as what we've brought today? Um, innovation is a major factor in creating GDP, but entrepreneurialism fades as GDP grows. 
uh, even highly innovative companies, you take Google, um, have to work hard to preserve an innovative culture. Right now, Google is going through a complete change process to try and rediscover the Google that uh, invented rather than buying innovation. Um, and the conservative ones, uh, they need outside help, but the help is available, and, and the help we can create ourselves. Um, innovation is not measured only by the number of patents per capita or R&D investment. Um, innovation is much broader and much deeper than that. Um, we, we've seen that the current economic powers will have to deal with a multipolar world. Things are changing. Brazil is rising. India is rising. Things will be different. It will be far less uh, easy to, to dominate markets, which means that we have to rediscover how to be innovative, how to be agile, how to change, how to adapt to different circumstances, and very importantly, how to make these alliances across borders, how to join with other companies, how to trust them, and how to leverage the strengths that we all have in different ways. And as I said before, a strong country brand is a valuable asset when you're working across borders. Um, which countries do you trust? Um, countries that trust each other work together. Countries that speak the same language work together, but there are other factors in trust. Um, what we've also discovered, which we maybe didn't um, use very strongly here, is that um, if hunger is not a motivator, you can use play, enjoyment, uh, personal interest as a motivator. Horiba um, is a, an interesting Japanese company based in Kyoto. And their motto, which is everywhere in the company, you pick up a, a set of chopsticks and it's got a little cover saying, Omoshiroku Okashiki. Uh, and they really believe that um, it's important to create that kind of um, enjoyment, culture of enjoyment in the company. Um, and if you think about innovative approach to branding, or at least um, applied branding, Nakagawa, a little uh, um, Nara-based company, which has just op opened up in Omote Sando Hills, small family-owned company, has built a hugely successful business on unique branding. And what they've done is made themselves the, the, the place that people want to work. Very interesting company. So what we're saying is that if you're open um, you focus on the important things in innovation, you, for, you form alliances and you have drive, you can create new structures for business and finance. And if you read Fast Company, I quite like Fast Company. Um, it has hundreds of examples. And, and we feel that the limits are really only there in our heads. Um, it's up to us to create these new structures. So if we look at the example of some of these small companies, this globalized world offers new options and opportunities. We can create new alliances. We're looking particularly at Japan and Europe, but it goes far beyond that. Um, and what we would say is start looking for those opportunities now. We are. Thank you. <laughs>